Welcome to the 2024 Sizzling Summer Series, sponsored by the University of Nebraska Medical Center, College of Public Health, Office of Public Health Practice, in partnership with Midwestern Public Health Training Center. My name is Brandon Drews. I'm the Workforce Development and Leadership Program Manager at UNMC. My colleague, Jessica Chavez-Thompson, and I will be your host for this series. Our sixth annual Sizzling Summer Series continues from last year's focus on exploring how to make data come alive. Now, more than ever, we are called to clearly communicate the invaluable impact of our field through data visualization. Over the months of June, July, and August, we will be hosting a three-part series, learning from experts as we build, stretch, and refine our skills to communicate the value of public health through data visualization. Today marks our first session with an insightful presentation by Caroline Hoffman on how to craft compelling stories for diverse audiences. Caroline is the Environmental Health Communications Manager at the Rhode Island Department of Health. Her work focuses on helping subject matter experts create and disseminate meaningful communication materials with actionable calls to action. She started her career working at public relations agencies in New York City specializing in communicating FDA approvals and clinical trial data, building patient engagement programs and in health crisis and issue preparedness. During this time, Caroline learned how to translate complex medicine, science, and data into meaningful information for the public and was introduced to the field of public health. Today, she will share her knowledge and best practices, accessibility tips, and more. Thank you, Caroline, for joining us today. We have just a few housekeeping items before we turn over to Caroline. For today's webinar, all participants will remain muted. However, we do encourage questions and dialogue in the chat box. There will be time for participant Q&A at the end of the webinar. My colleague and I will monitor the chat to ensure our speaker hears the questions today. Today's session is being recorded, and the recording and slides will be available on our website. We also invite you to evaluate your experience via a short survey. The link to the survey will be provided following the webinar. At this time, we'll turn it over to Carol. Thanks, Brandon. I am really excited to be here today to talk a little bit about what I have learned um, throughout my career about visualizing data and storytelling with data. Um, so first, I wanted to cover just the couple of um, learning objectives for today's sessions. We're going to cover the core elements of a data visualization, how to define your audience and customize content to meet their needs, and how to use data visualization in storytelling. But before I jump into that, I wanted to give just a, a quick introduction to myself. Um, as Brandon mentioned, I have spent over a decade as a health communicator. I started my career in New York City, really specializing in clinical trial data and FDA approvals as well as building patient advocacy and engagement programs. And when I was working on a health crisis and issues team, this is where I got introduced to the field of public health, um, especially during the emergence of the Zika virus. Ultimately, this led me to get my master's of public health at the Columbia University Mailman School of Health in the spring of 2021. And during my education, I was able to expand my own data skills but this is always where I like to clarify that I am not an epidemiologist. I am not a data analyst. I am a communicator who really enjoys working with and communicating about data. And since I graduated, I have been working at the Rhode Island Department of Health as the Environmental Health Communications Manager, supporting our many programs and centers in the Division of Environmental Health. So with that background, I wanted to jump in and get started. So first and foremost, I believe that communication is a strategic public health in intervention. But the good news is that we can all be communicators and improve that skill set. When we communicate data well and clearly, it empowers our audience to take an action or to make an informed decision. It can help build understanding and establish our organizations as a trusted source of information. On the other hand, when data isn't cl clearly communicated, it can create confusion or even lead to an erosion of trust. So really important that we work on our data communication skill sets. 
This is a high level overview of some of the best practices I have learned about data visualization and storytelling. And I'm gonna go into some of these in more detail throughout the presentation. But as an overview, first and foremost, the data visualization needs to be complete. It needs to have a clear denominator so we know what population we're talking about. It also needs to have enough information so that it's understandable on its own and can be interpreted without additional context from a voiceover or a caption. So you can think of this as things like clear labels, keys for interpreting color coding and those sorts of things. Data visualizations, in my opinion, often need context. While you can interpret the data, it does not tell the complete story on its own and adding context helps to create meaning for the user. It's also really important to use plain language to explain your key findings in the data visualization. And this really helps make sure everyone in your audience can understand what you're presenting. Ideally, your data visualization and messaging should be actionable. It should answer the question, so what now? And the call to action empowers our audience to do something. And then last, in public health, our numbers represent people. And one thing I've learned throughout my career is that we hold our health very dearly. So anything that challenges our health is really sensitive and vulnerable for people. And we need to keep that in mind and use extra care and consideration when we're communicating about issues and especially about data that impacts health. Those numbers represent real people in their real lives. Another really important component is planning for accessibility. This can be a little challenging with data visualization platforms, but it's important to start at the beginning of your work by identifying the accessibility needs of your audience. So this includes considering if they will be viewing the visualization on a mobile device, if it will need to be translated into another language, if the data visualization platform is compatible with screen readers or offers the ability to include image descriptions, and it includes making sure that the color palette you choose for the visualization is colorblind friendly. Now, my partner is red green colorblind, so we find the colorblind accessibility issues come up all of the time, uh, but I wanted to include a, a quick example for you. So we both wear the same smartwatch and use the associated app with a smartwatch, and we often go for runs together. And we find the data from the apps to be interesting because we both like data. So I was recently able to test out a beta update to the app while he kept the kind of original version of the app. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see two cadence graphs. And cadence is the number of steps you take per minute on a run. His is on the top with the black background. That's the original app. Mine is on the bottom with the white background. That's the beta update. And when we looked at them side by side, he commented that the beta update had a lot more colors and that he thought that was a really great feature. And we had a quick laugh when I pointed out that they actually both featured three colors. Um, this is a really innocuous example, but I think it shows the point that when we don't design data visualizations intentionally to be accessible, we miss it and we accidentally create inaccessible data visualizations. So just make sure that you're thinking about that when you get started and not trying to work accessibility in at the end. It's not an afterthought. So some more quick tips for developing data visualizations. Again, make sure your visualization includes a denominator. This is really important to making sure that the information can be interpreted. We also wanna make sure that the visualization has all of the information it needs to be interpreted. So this includes clear labels for your axes. It often means having a title for the visualization. If you're using color coding, making sure that you have a key and that any measure that is color coded is clearly labeled. We also wanna make sure that the data in our visualizations is accurate and transparent. This will help build trust with your audience. And the design should be as simple as possible. Your data visualization is like ourselves. We can't do everything and neither can the data visualization. So try to focus on just one or two key measures. When you're designing the visualization, you want to carefully consider the colors, shapes, and sizes that you're using. In addition to making sure that it's colorblind friendly, it's important to remember that the more of these factors that you use, the more difficult it is to interpret the data visualization. 
And it's important to choose the visual that best tells your story. So on the screen, I have the same statistic represented in two different ways. And I think that this shows an example that a pie chart or a percentage or a bar graph might not always be the best visual, even if it is the more traditional choice. 7% of children entering kindergarten in Rhode Island in 2019 had lead in their body. It's an interesting st statistic, but when we say one in 14 children entering kindergarten, it allows our audience to actually picture a kindergarten classroom and essentially count the number of kids that are impacted. And when we use an infographic style image, like the one on the screen, it centers the child in the message and reminds us who we're talking about. When it is time to choose a more traditional data visualization, bar charts are a great choice. They're not appropriate for all data, but they are used frequently, they're easy to understand, and I think audiences tend to be used to seeing them. So they are a really great option. Maps are also data-rich visualizations and they have become increasingly popular with the proliferation of GIS technology. On the screen, I am showing a model of the urban heat island in Providence, Rhode Island. And if you look at the map, it's pretty easy to see based on the color coding and the key but there is a 12 degree temperature difference across the city. And there's two things I love about using this map. The first is that I can tell you there's 12 degree temperature difference in the city, but it's really different when you can actually see it for yourself. And when you look closely at the map, it's really highlighting the fact that heat is not felt equally across the city. And some of those neighborhoods that are much, much hotter are really close to neighborhoods that are a lot cooler pointing to environmental conditions that might be causing the inequity. I also want to remind us all to keep it simple. I am somebody who likes data, so I find it very interesting and have to remind myself and remind the teams that I work with to take a step back and center our audience in what we're creating. And this means that sometimes the data is a supporting message, not the main message. So for these social media graphics, we developed them in 2022 in partnership with the American Lung Association with the goal of letting people know that the zip code they're in was experiencing an air quality alert in real time. And we had a discussion about whether or not we should include the air quality index value on these graphics. Ultimately, we decided against it for a couple of reasons. First, the air quality index value would need to be updated every time the air quality alert was issued, which just adds to the burden of creating these visualizations. Having a static graphic that does not need to be updated was a lot simpler for us. Second, if you're not familiar with the air quality index, the value isn't very meaningful. And because we're issuing these on social media, there's not a lot of space or bandwidth to educate someone on what the air quality index is and how to interpret it. And third, ultimately, at the end of the day, the air quality index value itself was not the most important message for our audience. We wanted them to know that the air they are breathing right now might be harmful to their health and there are steps they can take to protect themselves. So that was how we landed on this messaging for these graphics and not actually centering the data in it. But they did link out to a site that had the actual air quality index value in data and that had additional information on how to interpret that and information on the steps that they can take. So once you have a draft visualization, I try to put myself in the audience's shoes and answer these questions. What is the point or the main takeaway? Does it make sense? And why does it matter? And if I can't answer these questions by looking at my data visualization, it's a good signal that it either needs to be revised or needs to be paired with additional narrative context to add more meaning or to clarify the message. So now that we have discussed some of the best practices quickly, I wanted to go through an example with you. Um, so if you could go ahead and type in the chat how you think this data visualization could be improved. This is a real data visualization that I saw during a presentation recently, and this is exactly how it was presented on the screen. Now, there are a couple of really great things in this visualization. It includes a clear title. There's a clear time period, clear denominator, 
I like that they have used the bar chart. I think that that is a really appropriate choice for conveying this information. And I think it's really great that you can clearly see that there are different species of vibriosis that are being pictured here. But there are quite a few areas where this could be improved. Um, first, there's no key. So it's really difficult to interpret what the individual coloring in the bar graphs is showing. And when we look at the color coding, the um, coral color and the light green color, I'm concerned would be difficult for a colorblind audience. They look like they might be a little bit too similar for somebody who's red, green, colorblind. Additionally, the scale's not labeled, so we're assuming that the end is showing 100%, but we are forced to make that assumption. And when you look really closely at this, the right-hand side, those bars aren't all ending at the same place. So it is, it's just causing a little bit of confusion, and it's really hard to understand what the point of this data visualization is, what the main takeaway is, without having the voiceover that was provided with it. Um, another example I wanted to share is just to show that changing the axes in your data visualization can significantly skew the data and how it looks. So on the right-hand side, the y-axis goes from 0 to 100%, which would be the standard scale. On the left-hand side, the axis has been shortened from 58 to 78%. And in that left-hand graphic, the difference between these two st statistics looks much more significant than on the right-hand side. So it really skews how you're interpreting the data. So I have developed kind of an informal process for developing visualizations with my team. We start by determining the topic and identifying the audience that the visualization will be for. Then we define the scope because again, our visualization won't be able to cover everything. What's we identify the most important things to cover and we identify the audience's needs. That I'm bringing together a team that often includes a data analyst and a subject matter expert. And we work together to develop, review, revise, review, revise, and on. If you have the opportunity, I encourage you to invite your community to provide input on the visualization when appropriate. And then we're ready to publish and promote. And alongside this step, Right before we hit publish, I try to anticipate the questions that the visualization may raise and be ready to answer them. Quickly answering questions that come up alongside your visualization can help build trust with your audience. And taking the time to think about the questions that your visualization may raise can help you identify weaknesses or areas that may cause confusion that you might have missed during the review process before it actually gets published. So I really encourage that step. So digging into identifying our audience a little bit, there are many audiences in public health that we can talk to and they're, they're pretty varied. So determining exactly who you're going to be developing the visualization for is important. When we know who we're creating for, we can center them and their needs in the development process and your audience should impact the level of detail and the complexity of your design. It's important to keep in mind that there are varying literacy rates in the US. According to the National Literacy Institute, over half of US adults are below a sixth grade reading level. Um, so it's again, just really important to be specific about your audience and allow that to inform what you're developing and this ultimately improves the communications we're delivering to them. And on the screen, I have some examples of audiences that you might be considering for your data visualization. And given the, the breadth of audiences and their potential familiarity with a topic, one visualization likely will not meet the needs of all of these audiences. So after we identify the audience, we want to get to know them a little bit better. We don't wanna make assumptions about what they know, but it's important to find out what they already understand what information they, they want or need, where they typically get their information, who they trust as a source of information, and how their lived experience impacts how they receive information and who their trusted sources are. You can find a lot of this information from demographic research, 
from listening on social media and from direct conversation with community members. And all of this should inform how we create for our audiences. So I work with our lead poisoning prevention team, and we have some laws in Ro Rhode Island related to the presence of lead in rental homes specifically. So we are often trying to reach two separate audiences, the first being the landlord or the homeowner, and the second as an individual. And when we developed these graphics, we determined that the most important message for the landlord Lord audience was to identify how common lead was really and how they can determine if their properties are safe. For the individual, they're less concerned about the community level and more concerned about their individual house and access to resources that will make it more accessible to uh, fund or to pay for lead hazard mitigation. And so you can see in the graphics on the screen how those needs really drove the messaging and the data that we provided for each audience. Now, we probably didn't meet our best practice of keeping the data visualization simple. So we are in the process of recreating social media graphics for the lead poisoning team, and we have moved on to a much simpler format. These are not yet live, um, so this is a little bit of a preview. But you can actually see that we determined that using the three and four rental homes statistic would be meaningful for both the renter and the landlord and pairing it with a different tagline or call to action helped to make it more specific for each audience. So for renters, it is important for them to know that three and four rental homes do not have the required lead certificate. And we wanna encourage them to know their home's status and know their rights as a tenant. And for landlords, while that same statistic is meaningful, we want to really emphasize that they need to know if their rental home has one and take action to get that lead certificate. So getting really specific on your audience and their needs and what actions you need to take can help make sure that you're creating for them. Another example from a slightly different viewpoint was we wanted to design an infographic for family-based child care providers that included information about environmental contaminants. And it was important for us to remember that these child care providers who are running child care centers out of their homes may not have heard of all of these environmental contaminants beforehand. There was also quite a bit of information and a lot of detail that could be presented in the infographic but would likely be very overwhelming for the reader, especially somebody who is not familiar with these contaminants. So ultimately we decided to try to keep it as simple as possible and provide just enough information for someone to know what the contaminant is and why it's important and if there's a step that they can take. And there's a couple of ways that we broke this down. So first we decided to use a house illustration to help the user understand where something might be present in the house. We also used color coding on the number indicators to show if the contaminant might be present in the house already, or if it's something that the child care provider should take caution to avoid introducing. We also included icons that would indicate if the contaminant is regulated as part of licensing for the child care provider, if it can cause health effects, and if there's an additional action that the child care provider would need to take. And this helps give them enough information to be have this general level of education and then go forward and take the additional steps that they need to. So when it comes to actually storytelling with data, there are narrative components to it and visual components to it. Adding narrative to a data visualization can help really help answer that so what question, and it improves our audience's understanding. And adding narrative can really help address differences in familiarity and the literacy levels of your audience. But adding images to a data visualization can illustrate and reinforce a concept. I think this is an example of where the age old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words is really true. So this is another heat, urban heat island map, similar to the one that we looked at earlier in this presentation. This time it is presented with screen grabs of specific roads or intersections that are located in different parts of Providence. 
And by including these images, it allows the user to see and understand the environmental conditions that can contribute to the development of the urban heat island effect for themselves. And allowing someone to draw that conclusion on their own can make it much longer lasting than if we simply told them. So when you're looking at this, you can pretty clearly see that the areas that are hotter have fewer trees and more buildings, and the areas that are cooler have more trees. So that helps us understand the urban infrastructure component of the urban heat island effect. For narrative storytelling, it's really important to craft a clear message. And part of that includes explaining the data in simple terms and using plain language. Plain language is really important and it's communication that your audience can understand the first time they read or hear it. It is writing designed to ensure the reader understands it quickly, easily, and completely as possible. And it strives to be easy to read, easy to understand, and easy to use. So as part of this, we want to avoid jargon when we can. And if you have to include a technical term, it's important to define it. I also encourage my teams to reconsider the flow of information that they are presenting. Academic and scientifically trained audiences tend to lead with background when writing, but we're fighting for short attention spans and limited bandwidth in our audiences. So it's important to lead with the most important information when we can, and then add the background as context where it adds value or clarity to the message. I also wanted to share some resources that I have found really helpful in my work. Plainlanguage.gov is a wonderful resource for plain language writing. The SMOG index is a tool that will evaluate the complexity of a couple of sentences, and you can edit in the tool to see how that changes the reading level of them. And the CDC Clear Communication Index is very, very helpful as well. So after we have a clear message, it's important to pair it with a call to action. And I find that at the heart of health promotion and risk reduction, we really wanna be catalyzing our audience to make an informed decision or take an action. And the call to action can be integrated into our narrative. So it's very clear. It answers the question, what can I do? And where I work in environmental health, we get this question a lot because it's not always clear when there's environmental contamination, what someone can do. But I think it's important across public health topics. It's also really helpful to give your audience options for what they can do when you can. Um, individual choice is very important in the U.S. culturally, so providing your audience with a variety of options they can take to protect their health from something um, helps to encourage them to do so. So not every audience is the same. If you're like me, you live in the details and the weeds and the nuances, but not everyone does. So determining what level of detail is appropriate for your audience is a really important step. And the bikes, bite snack meal approach, which is a content writing strategy that was introduced by Leslie O'Flavin in 1997 is incredibly helpful. It breaks content down into three categories. First, you have the bite, which is a short message that communicates only one point. This might cover what and why it matters. You can think of it as a headline or one or two sentences. And this is great for somebody who is not very familiar with the topic. The snack is a little bit more detailed. It provides more of a summary and includes some context or detail. It is often one or two paragraphs, and this is really great for community organizers or people who have influence in the community. It gives them enough context to start a conversation with somebody who might not be familiar. And the meal is for our deep divers. It's an in-depth material. It can include full background and descriptions in a lot of detail. This is often a full report or an article. And when we're considering a plain language approach to messaging, we want to be providing more of a bite for the general public, but it is really important if that bite can link to more information for people who do want to go deeper. And that's a really great way to provide more information without overwhelming someone. Um, 
So I'm going to walk through some examples from our partnership with the American Lung Association on air quality. And on a little bit of context, we started working together in 2022 when air quality, especially in the Northeast, was largely discussed as an environmental issue. And we wanted to develop materials and messaging that brought the health impacts of air quality to the center of the conversation. So first up is our bite. This is the social media post that we looked at earlier in the presentation. It's ready to be used without any updates. And it was geo-targeted to people in an area with an air quality alert. You can see on the graphic that there are two very short sentences that are written with words that are easy to understand. And as I mentioned earlier, this graphic linked out to additional information with the exact data and what steps the audience could take. I also want to note that all of these materials were developed in partnership, not only with the American Lung Association, but with the Rhode Island Healthy Air Collaborative. And as part of the collaborative, we had membership from some of the Rhode Island communities that are most impacted by air quality and asthma issues. So they were able to provide direct input and feedback on these materials as they were being developed. I also just wanna note that this um, tactic in 2022 uh, garnered 890,000 impressions and the state of Rhode Island has just over a million people in it. So we were able to reach potentially a significant amount of the population. And there were nearly 3000 clicks through to more information. So again, providing that bite can be a really great way to get somebody interested and to provide the most important information. And the, the social media posts linked out to airnow.gov. And so I have some screen grabs from the other day from airnow.gov in case you're not familiar with it. Um, what appears first is this graphic that shows what the air quality index is now. So when I took this the other day, it was good. But you can see in the forecast at the bottom that the air quality was expected to worsen to moderate. And then if you scroll in the graphic or look at the right hand side of the screen, you can see that they provide some additional information about who should be concerned about this level of pollutant and what they can do. So this was a great resource for us to link out to, but a little bit more difficult to interpret than the air quality is hazardous now. So that brings us to the snack. This was a postcard that was developed and it was geo-targeted to people who are living in hot hotspot asthma zip codes. So zip codes that had significantly higher rates of asthma. And you can see there's a headline for the postcard that is more of the bite, but we start to get into some additional details here. This provides a lot more information than we had just on the social media graphic. But this is something that we expect somebody to, re to receive physically and potentially take some time to sit down and look at. Um, we also include that QR code. They can scan to get additional information. And then last is the meal. This was a fact sheet developed for somebody who might be familiar with the term air pollution, but might not know a lot about it and who is interested in learning a little bit more. This has a lot more detail than either the bite or the snack, but is still written from a plain language and clear communication perspective. And when you look closely at the meal content, you can actually see that it is broken down into different bites and snacks. Breaking more complex information down into bites and snacks is a really helpful approach for clearly communicating complicated information. It also helps to organize information for people who are skimming or who are not able to take in all of the information at once. I think that that is a very helpful approach for breaking things down. Adding narrative to your data visualization helps to tell a complete story. Um, so I, I wanted to walk through a couple of examples like this. On the screen is what we call a data spotlight for one of the programs I work with. We take an existing data visualization. In this case, it's a map of asthma at the zip code level. We include an explanation of the data, some additional context about why the data matters, and a call to action for what the person can do with what they have learned. Here's another example using some different data. This is the beach closure data. Again, you can see there's an explanation of the data. 
this was really important because this visualization is a little bit more complex. We're showing two different measures that needed two different axes. So it's a little harder to see, especially if you're not familiar with looking at this type of visualization. And we paired it with some additional context about why it mattered and a call to action to learn more. And I have found that when we pair these pieces of information, we can actually drive the conversation that's happening in the media. So for both of these, we put the data spotlight together and we shared it on social media and it was picked up by local journalists. The asthma hotspots were highlighted by the Providence Journal and the beach closure data was highlighted by an environmental news organization in Rhode Island called EcoRI. At the same time, data can also build on an individual story. So this is a, an article from December of 2022 in the Providence Journal, and they highlighted a couple's experience with their children having high blood lead levels. The story leads with a really high impact personal experience, and the reader may feel like they are essentially living through this with the family. But then the article connects it to data about lead exposure rates in Rhode Island at large. And this connects us to a broader call to action or warning for our communities that helps us see another person's experience as something that might happen to us, which will hopefully result in people taking action to get screened for lead or remove lead hazards in their home. So data can drive the story or complement the story, but it's definitely an important part of storytelling. And I also wanted to walk through an example from idea to product to promotion. So on the screen, you can see the RIDO Climate Change Data Explorer. This is a data visualization that actually houses a number of data visualizations. It includes a lot of data related to different climate factors and different measures, and it's, it's pretty complex. So on the screen, this is showing the average temperature trend from 1895 to 2020, and you can see a pretty clearly pretty distinct pattern in the average temperature in the state. We also have a map of the projected number of additional days above 90 degrees. Um, this one is very interactive. You can choose the years you want to look at, a threshold for a heat day, as well as emission scenarios to see how that changes. And it is displayed on the map at the county level in Rhode Island. And those are just two of several data visualizations in this data explorer. So starting from the beginning, we were asked to create an interactive data product that would help Rhode Islanders understand weather trends related to climate change and their connection to human health. And so the team was a data analyst, a climate change and health subject matter expert, and a communication specialist. And following that process we talked about earlier, we started by defining the scope and the goal of the project, and then moved into identifying topics and data sets. And our climate change subject matter expert really led, took the lead on identifying the data that would and would not be included and the measures that were important and meaningful from a technical perspective. The data analyst was responsible for developing the product framework and creating draft visualizations. And then as a team, we reviewed the visualizations together and discussed if the overall formats were the best display for specific data points. And then as part of this review process, the climate change expert and myself really determined that the visualizations would benefit from having a small amount of additional narrative context. Some of the climate change data measures are very technical and are not intuitive for an audience who has not heard of them before. So we needed to provide a short explanation of what data was being shown on the screen so that somebody could interpret the data visualization and understand its meaning. And we reviewed and negotiated and edited and reviewed. And a really significant part of this was making sure that the visualizations had consistent elements throughout the entire data explorer. And also, of course, doing a um, quality check to make sure that all of the buttons worked appropriately. And so after about six or eight months, we had a product that was ready to go that we posted on our website. 
And then it was time to spread the word because when you have invested that many resources and that much effort into creating a visualization, it should not just sit and collect dust on your website. We pushed it out proactively in program newsletters. We announced the availability of this resource on social media. We featured it in the data spotlights that I shared earlier, and those spotlights were cross-posted to social media. But I think the value of this asset really showed in how we were able to use it as a reactive storytelling aid. So when you put the resources into creating a clear data visualization, make sure that you have it at hand in case you get questions that it can help answer. We used the data visualization in response to media inquiries. We were able to provide it to the governor's office when they had questions and were working on climate related policy. We shared it with partners at the Department of Environmental Management and at academic institutes. And we were able to use the data visualization to join organic conversations happening in our community on social media. So last year, Rhode Island had record-breaking rainfall in the summer, but in the year before that, we were in drought. And um, there's a lot of conversation about drought in Rhode Island. So we took a couple of, of days to develop uh, some social media graphics in Canva, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, that provided a basic level of education about what drought is, why it was happening in Rhode Island, and what some of the impacts and health impacts of drought are. There were a couple more graphics that we developed that just aren't shown on the screen. And then we were able to pair this with the Climate Change Data Explorer visualization that showed the Palmer Drought Index. And by pairing the educational information about drought with the Drought Index visualization, we were able to help our communities understand how the drought that they were experiencing today was related to larger weather trends that have been happening for a much longer time. Um, so I will stop there, but I wanted to share my contact information in case you have any questions or would like access to any of the materials. And I am happy to stop the presentation and take questions. Great. We have a couple questions that are in the chat. If others come up, please continue to add them to the chat. The first question we had was, when translating graphics into various languages, do you alter the image slash message? And how do you ensure your message is still clear? That is a really good question. Um, I think it's best if you can have somebody on your team who's a native language speaker. Um, that way they can provide input on some of the cultural differences. Um, I, I know even for much simpler things, our translation team has informed us that for specific populations, using like bullet points is not something that they do standard in written materials in their language. So being able to talk to somebody who's a native speaker about some of those nuances and how that might impact your data visualization is really important. As far as ensuring clarity for the message, as a best practice, we actually use two separate vendors to do our translation. So we'll have the English version that goes out for translation into the second language. And then we hire a completely separate vendor to proofread the second translation. So we try to get at least two sets of eyes on it. Um, you can also always back translate something into English and see if your message has changed at all throughout the translation process. And then we had a follow-up question that was added to the Q&A. Do you have any resources that you can recommend to check our communication products for visual accessibility, high enough contrast, color blindness, et cetera? Yes. Um, there are some really great resources out there. As far as for color palettes specifically, I often use a resource called Color Brewer. Brewer which can suggest color palettes that like you can select a dropdown that will show only colorblind friendly color palettes. And you can also input if the data trend that you're trying to show is divergent or a couple of other factors that will impact whether or not your color palette should be various hues along the same color scale, or if you wanna use maybe like two different colors to show diverging trends. Um, 
I, I find it to be really, really valuable. Um, and then I, I think also the 508 compliance guidelines have some specific requirements related to color contrast. So that's another great resource. Wonderful, thank you for that additional resource. We had one more question we saw in the chat and that was what type of graph or chart is best to represent data that has a total more than 100%? Would there be any other way to represent this data other than graphs? I'm trying, I, I don't know if that person can provide a little bit more context. I'm not sure when you would have a total more than 100%, but that, and I, so, that that's a challenging question. I don't know if there's additional context they can provide. While we wait for that context, in case we don't see in the chat here shortly, we do have one other question and we can come yeah. back as well. And the question is, how do you negotiate a difference of opinion between subject matter experts and communication specialists? Communication specialists may see something as essential simplification, or as an expert may see it as misleading. Yes, this comes up all the time in the work that I do, especially because the subject matter experts that I work with tend to have a lot of technical expertise in like toxicology and engineering, and I am not a toxicologist and not an engineer. So when there is a difference of opinion, I try to start by establishing common ground and a common goal. Uh, we, at the end of the day, we want the audience to have the information they need to make a decision. And if we confuse them, they're not going to be able to make a decision. So then I try to, you know, if we've gone back and forth in the comments a couple of times or over email, I like to have a conversation with the person because I think we understand each other better when we're talking to each other and can respond in real time. And I try to understand why they feel in particular that this technical thing needs to stay and not be simplified. And as part of that, I also try to explain what the risk is when we're not simplifying something. Is it better to have a technical term that somebody's not going to understand or to have a slight, slightly simplified term that somebody is more likely to understand, even if it's not the most technically accurate? And oftentimes we can navigate our way through that and we end up with something kind of in the middle ground. But sometimes it really does need to stay the way that it was, and it needs to have the technical term or whatever it was that created the um, conflict at the beginning. And then I like to see if the subject matter expert and I can come up with like another sentence that would follow that one that would try to explain the concept in plain language. So it's okay if we include something a little more technical or a technical term, as long as we can follow it up with a plain language ex explanation of some sort. But this this comes up a lot and it's it's always a little difficult to work through. I don't see a clarification of the question, but I do see the individual's name. And what I may do is just follow up with an email with you, Caroline, with them to get yeah. that question answered. I'm going yeah, I would be happy to to work through them offline. That sounds like a very interesting challenge to work through. So I'd, I'd be happy to put some thought to that. And then I'm going to just give it a moment to see if anyone else has a question or in the chat or as well. While others are thinking of their questions, I have a question for you, Caroline, and it kind of uh, bounces off what you were just discussing. Um, you were sharing examples of how to provide simple and clear uh, and accessible communication tools for data and um, a little bit here, where, where are those challenges and risks when it comes to ensuring that you're not necessarily perpetuating a harmful narrative? Um, and so I was wondering if you have any like examples, um, any experience that you can call back to about how you may have had to change course with your communication strategy to prevent any kind of unintended uh, harm to it. 
to a community or communities? Yes. So this is something that we have had to be very cautious with when working on lead poisoning prevention. So there's, you know, secondary prevention where we do screening and can determine if somebody has a high blood lead level and we can do interventions. But we also have some pretty amazing primary prevention programs where we really try to prevent exposure to lead poisoning by improving housing conditions. But we know that um, people who are at higher risk of being exposed to lead in their home are more likely to be renting and they're more likely to be in urban areas. And so the messaging for educating somebody about housing conditions that can be dangerous and their rights and the actions that they can take, we've had to be very careful and consult with legal on like what we can tell someone to do that is not going to put them at risk for things like landlord retaliation that can contribute to, you know, like socioeconomic challenges and things like that. Um, the other one that I was actually just discussing with a colleague the other day was how to use data, like the fact that we know that certain areas in this in Providence and in other cities have been redlined and um you know, have been uh, historically disinvested in. And so we see that these communities are more vulnerable to um, extreme weather scenarios and people in those communities often are lower income um, and may not be able to adapt to extreme weather conditions. But it's not a result of the fact that, you know, they're a specific race or ethnicity. It's these larger systemic inequities that are driving some of these problems. And so figuring out the nuance of how to communicate who is at risk without re necessarily assigning them responsibility for having that risk when it's undue. I, I, I don't know if that was clear. That kind of came up um, the other day. Thank you for answering that question. We saw one more question in the Q and A, and it is: Can you talk just a little bit about any experience you might have testing your messages with the intended audience or audiences? Yes, this is a really important step. It's definitely a best practice, but I also know it's not something we're able to do all of the time because it often has an additional um, cost to it. But um. It's actually something we're in the process of doing right now in um, two ways for different projects related to lead poisoning. One of them is that we were trying to determine if the phrase that lead is toxic or lead is poisonous was more impactful for the audience. So we are actually going to be putting out social media graphics with paid advertising that use both of those phrases and seeing which one has more engagement, which one causes more questions, and use that as a little bit of A-B testing. At the same time, we are also working on developing some communications specifically for refugee and immigrant populations who may be exposed to lead in spices. And so we know that they may bring spices from home from the country that they're from, and this has a lot of cultural significance and is something that we need to be really mindful about how we communicate about. And so the first step of this process is going to be having um, in-depth interviews and conversations with these community members to understand, first and foremost, how they react to and understand the messaging that we already have about lead in general, but then also gauging kind of their perceptions and using that to develop messaging for our campaign. And then we will be taking all of the materials that we develop back to them for feedback before they go out into the world, um, just again, to make sure that we're being culturally sensitive. So yeah, really important to be um, talking to your community and trying to get their input before you finalize something. I'm not seeing any further questions either in the Q&A or in the chat. So I wanna take this time to thank Caroline for today's presentation, answering all these questions and helping us to better understand how to communicate this data through effective strategies and means to do so. With that, I see one more question in the chat. While that question gets addressed, I'm also gonna put in the chat to everyone, just the registration for our next Sizzling Summer Series webinar on July 31st. The question that I see in the chat is, what are some common metrics for measuring engagement for printed materials? 
Um, I mean, that can definitely be difficult to measure engagement on a printed material because I, I mean, realistically, like we don't have the technology at hand to see how long somebody is spending with the material. We often use the number that are distributed at an event. Um, you can also do qualitative engagement, like the kind of conversation that the material creates. Um, the other thing that you can do is have a QR code or a specific URL on the material, and you can see the number of times that someone um, clicks through or goes to that site in relation to when that material was distributed. I think ultimately, you know, if you're trying to impact a larger health outcome, for example, like if we distributed a fact sheet about lead poisoning, we can see click throughs to the link, but it will be difficult to determine if that ultimately leads to behavior change. But hopefully over time, we'll be able to see that the more education that we do, the more community engagement that we do, the higher those screening rates or the better those health outcomes become. I see one more question in the chat, just to clarify the resource in the chat that Jessica Chavez Thompson just put in is the one you're referring to before about the color brewer. Can you confirm that, Caroline, looking in the chat? Yeah, let me see. That that URL looks right. Let me pop that open. Yes, that is it. I have found this to be just so incredibly helpful because you can input the number of data classes that you want the nature of your data, and then um, have it show only ones that are colorblind safe or if it's going to be a print material. Um, I think that this is has been a really helpful tool for me and my team. So yes, that is the correct link. Great. And I see some additional links being added to the chat for additional resources for people to be able to check out. I want to spend the last couple of minutes just to say thank you again, everyone, for being able to join today's call for Caroline for presenting. Also want to just mentioned thank you in advance for completing today's survey. It will also be sent out in the next 24 hours in an email to everyone that was able to attend today. We look forward to seeing everyone hopefully on our next call on July 31st for session two on the art of persuasion using data to enhance credibility, logic, and emotional appeal. Everyone from today's call that's registered will receive the information registered for the next one. Thank you again, everyone. And have a wonderful day. Thank you.